Yeah, we're good. Can everyone see Lee's screen? Okay, cool. Uh, so, Lee, I think we should just get started. Uh, we have a good amount of people here, and I'll let people in as they uh, as they come. Okay. Uh, so, first and foremost, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I would say that we are all busy, and some of us might be even busier now that we're all home and work and trying to figure everything out. But I know that Lee and I both appreciate you taking the time and chatting martial arts with us, which we're both incredibly passionate about. And we're gonna go into a little bit about what brought us here to create this and who we are in general. So it, at this point, if your microphones are still on, just kindly mute them, especially in my neighborhood, they're screaming off the top of their lungs to greet and thank all the healthcare workers, which is an amazing gesture, but might cause a little bit of dissonance on the, on the call. So who am I? And uh, so I, I train with some of you, so some of you might not know all of this about me or that my name is Jordan in the first place. Uh, but basically I'm, I'm a physical therapist, uh, just like Dr. Scantolides. I have a background in strength training. Uh, I do a lot of powerlifting. Uh, which is squats, bench, and deadlift. I also specialize in strength and conditioning and mobility work. Um, there's a lot of letters after my last name, but I'm not going to elaborate so much on that. But my experience with martial arts dates back to when I was a child. Uh, I actually started in judo first, which was the sport that I didn't want to do, but my father forced me to do, uh, just to, I guess he was living vicariously through us at the time, my brother and I. Uh, and then that, trickled along to Taekwondo, which I pursued a little bit more in depth and ended up getting my first degree black belt in. Uh, but recently, my, my passion has become capoeira. I, uh, it kind of came to me. I was reading a book in the park and I didn't really expect much of anything until I saw people doing some cool uh, flips and what we call floreos in, in capoeira and it intrigued me. And I've been addicted ever since. And also, just as a fun fact, I, a lot of people tell me that I look like Nick Jonas. <laughs> not, not my twin brother, just me. Uh, but I figured I'd throw that in there. All right, yeah. And um, I am also a, a doctor of physical therapy. And uh, I've been a long time strength and conditioning specialist. I started uh, about 2001 uh, doing official training and I was coaching certain sports such as Taekwondo. That was probably my main um, experience in martial arts. So I, I've been training in Taekwondo for a while, over 20 years, and I did most of my competition in Taekwondo. Um, I have a little bit of karate background, a little bit of Hapkido and Japanese Jiu Jitsu, but most recently uh, training at Henzo Gracie as a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And before that, I was doing a little bit of uh, Thai kickboxing. So my biggest love right now is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and I really love working uh, with patients that uh, have experience in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and either trying to prepare for it and or have been injured while doing it. And I myself uh, train at uh, 40 years old and, and compete at 40 years old, so I think that's a, a unique uh, situation since our bodies change quite a bit as we get older and just to find out certain things that keep us healthy while training is, is super important. So I found certain things that have not only helped my patients, but have helped myself to continue to train and continue to do what I want to do. Sorry, I'm totally paying attention. Someone else wants to get in it that apparently they did not get the link. So I'm sending it to them. No worries. Um, so 2020 kind of sucks. I think we can all <laughs> Agree. Well, unless you're incredible, there are silver linings, which we'll talk about given the situation, but 2020 really sucks. And I consider the passing of Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and the rest of the passengers on that plane to be a really tragic event. Um, no matter whether, whether you're into basketball or not, I think his uh, influence was uh, felt on a large scale across the, the globe. And then here we are, all quarantined. I think this is the fourth full week that we're all in quarantine. Yep. And I think uh, I'm starting to look like a caveman. I'm definitely seeing my muscles start to uh, decrease in size a little bit. But yeah, we're all stuck at home and uh, things are different. Now, though the quarantine 
has proposed a lot of challenges. Like I know none of us are able to train together. I know for Capoeira, it's been incredibly challenging because what we call the Hoda, which is what we all, we all stand in a circle and pretty much take turns sparring one another. That's like us coming together and really sharing our passion for our training. Uh, that's been taken away from us, so it's been difficult. And just in general, the, the recommendations to adopt social distancing and working from home. And I, I've heard, I'm not a parent, but I've heard that homeschooling is actually pretty difficult with the amount of work that the students are given. And some of them are getting used to technology and stuff. So as a parent, it becomes a, an even increased demand if you have a, a work from home job and you also have to take care of your, your child. However, uh, there is a lot of opportunity uh, at this time. And Lee, press the press one more. Yeah, <laughs> I, added, <laughs> I had to add that, add that in there. Uh, everyone keeps, uh, people keep uh, requesting to come in. Uh, one of the things that I like to tell people to do right now is think about something that they've always wanted to try, whether it's, you know, maybe you wanted to cook something knew you wanted to learn a language. I know that there's people in my capoeira class that are learning Portuguese, which will make them better capoeiristas, uh, which is a positive thing. And now that you have time to do that, definitely throw your energy there. We're gonna talk a little bit more about adopting health habits in a little bit, but most of the presentation is gonna be focusing on decreasing the loss of training gains and improving flaws in your technique. There is not much of a better time to work on these things when you're not able to train as, as much as usual in person. So take the time to think about, okay, where are the flaws in my game where I can, maybe if I have tightness, if I have weakness, that I can, uh, I can spend the time now so that when I get back into the training center, I'm gonna be an even better version of myself. But I'm a realist. I know that life doesn't just work out so well because I say that there's opportunities at an ominous time when we don't know when things are gonna to return to normal and we're all just kind of still trying to figure it out. I know that I even at this point haven't 100% mastered quarantine life. I've definitely been experiencing some of the effects of staring at a screen for too long. I mean, even my Capoeira class is on Zoom and then I'm on the computer for work and I usually spend time on the computer or watch or on my phone, it's driving me crazy. And just trying to train around things that are going on at home, whether you have children running around all day or you don't have a lot of space, can't really go outside to escape the lack of space you have inside and you're just going, you're going crazy. Pretty much there's a lot of things that have been confounded given this current situation that can really complicate your ability to train, but uh, we'll elaborate that in a little bit. So I'm gonna I'm gonna code I'm gonna tag team with Leah on this one. This is one of my favorite visual images about our capacity to perform. If you think about the cup as representing our capacity to perform, and the contents of the cup in this case water or whatever liquid you whichever liquid you prefer, being all of the factors that can decrease our capacity to perform. So. I, on the on the left is listed all the some of the major factors that can decrease our capacity to perform. One thing that I have been paying particular attention to is sleep quality. Now, usually during the week, it might be more difficult to get seven hours of sleep because of work, because of other obligations, or maybe you just have a hard time falling asleep because you're you're drinking coffee or eating late at night because of your work schedule. Now might be a time where you can refocus that because sleep has a lot of benefits, not only just you know for psychological benefits, but it helps us retain information. It helps us make better food choices because when you're tired, you know it's been proven that you consume at least 250 to 300 calories per day on average extra if you're not able to make sound decisions because you're tired. Obviously, tissue damage, you can hurt yourself uh, because your capacity to perform has been impeded by more levels of stress. I know a lot of us right now are going through 
stress of maybe uh, unemployment or making less money or just fear of how things are going to work out in the future. And all of that, believe it or not, is going to decrease our capacity to perform, which increases our likelihood of getting hurt, which is why it's important to think about the things that can build your capacity to perform at a time when you have time. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Lee. Yeah, I, I, uh, this, this is really uh, important stuff because it's so simple, but it's also has been heavily researched. I think that's one thing that we can chat about is that basics of sleeping, your diet, your hydration, those things that uh, one can manage a little bit easier, especially now, um, you can help improve your performance and help decrease your likelihood of getting injured once you're back on the mat or once you're back in the uh, back in class. So um, things like this are are really important to see what you can work on and to build up your capacity by the time you get back to full on training. Yeah, and this was created by my favorite Canadian physical therapist and chiropractor. He's he's the best. He has a lot of good information on managing pain. Uh, his name's Greg Lehman. If you guys are interested, he's he's fantastic. So because training is different now, and I know for me, I've gone from lifting close to 400 pounds off of the ground doing my deadlifts, and now I'm unable to replicate that at home. I've had to adapt and find new ways, methods of training, but it hasn't come without some residual soreness or tightness that I haven't experienced before. So what I like to tell my, my clients and those people I interact with is that you can train with a little bit of discomfort and it's and it could be safe so i use a traffic light model which is usually used in tendon research so if you have like a patellar tendonitis or an achilles tendonitis they usually use these indicators but it's transferable uh, throughout all injuries all body parts and all means of exercise so pain is the most difficult thing to measure and so basically we use a scale from zero to 10, zero being no pain at all and 10 being the worst you could possibly imagine. So if it's been proven that if you can modify your training to be between a zero to three, you're good to go. If you can do a kick, if you can do a hold or some sort of movement and it's not causing more than three out of 10 pain, absolutely 100% you can continue. It's when you start to get closer to the four to five range where you have to exercise caution where it doesn't mean you can't continue to work through a particular exercise. It just means you have to be mindful that if the yellow light starts to inch up towards the red light, so if you're doing a particular movement and it starts at a four, but it's steadily increasing to a six or seven, it's probably best that you try to find another way to do that movement or just stop doing it all together and try to revisit it another time. By the way, if uh, I know we're, we're kind of breezing along here, if you guys have immediate questions, uh, like I said, you could write in the chat or you can shout it out and I'll do my best to address them. One of the things that over the years, and I, I remember all of my high school coaches having us do static stretching before performance and I want to pull my hair out and I have more of it now to pull out. Uh, <laughs> I know if that wasn't funny, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying. Uh, <laughs> but. I think about stretching and yes, there are benefits to stretching, but people generally stretch because they think it's going to prevent injury or if they are injured, they think it's going to help heal it. So I did a pretty extensive review of the research because I have time and I care. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so it's basically stretching is good for many things. It will improve your flexibility as long as it's done consistently for several weeks. So if you trained for three weeks at a training center, dojo, whatever you like to call it, and you only stretch there, the likelihood that you're going to increase your flexibility significantly is pretty low. But stretching does feel nice it, because it does release endorphins and giving you the sense of feeling good is positive. You can feel pain relief by if you believe that something is actually helping you, whether it is or, or it isn't. So the positive benefits of stretching are only those. And I say that because on the next slide, we talk about all the negative things that go into stretching and why stretching 
in the conventional sense might not be as important to your training as you might think. So you can stretch, but if it's held for, if you hold a stretch for greater than 45 seconds, there have been correlations to decreased strength, power, explosiveness, and balance, which I think in all of our sports, we absolutely need. So definitely a terrible idea to hold a stretch for longer than 45 seconds. But even if you hold it for less than 45 seconds, there wasn't really a significant effect on all the above um, variables that I just discussed. And if we're talking about building strength, so this might not apply so much to us as martial artists, but if you were working on building strength in the gym, it might actually help reduce the, the gains that you experience. But one thing we do know for sure, or we can't prove, is that stretching is gonna prevent you from getting hurt, even if you do it before or after exercise. And historically, you know, people thought that they need to be a certain amount of flexible in order to prevent injury. But what we actually need is for our muscles, our tendons, our ligaments to be really stiff. And I say that not in getting you to think that we need to be inflexible, but it's all about resilience to stress. We need to be able to accept massive loads at very quick speeds or different changes in direction. And just being flexible isn't enough if you don't have mastery or you don't have control of those movements. So there's less of a, a benefit to being flexible, but it doesn't mean anything if you aren't stable and you don't own the flexibility that you have. And then, oh, sorry. yes, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Just to quickly add on to this is if you uh, remember that slide uh, with the cup, it's, it's similar in terms of we're trying to build a bigger capacity of these tissues. So stretching in and itself doesn't build the bigger capacity. We have to almost stress those tissues in a very progressive and, and appropriate way to get them more tolerant to things like either tension or, or contraction uh, or compression. So they're finding now and now the research that just basic flexibility training or stretching does not increase the capacity per se versus let's say mobility training or strengthening. All right, so we just got a question. At what point do we stretch and where does it fit into a training program? That's a fantastic question. Uh, I think you ultimately have to go back to why you're stretching. What, what is the purpose of you stretching? What, what is it, how is it going to improve your performance? So there is benefit to, and Lee, you can definitely uh, chime in on this. Sure. Where and when does it fit is probably the million dollar question that is the most difficult thing to provide a clear cut answer. I certainly would not stretch in a static sense before activity. I don't think there's any benefit to doing it and there could be potential harm. Uh, afterward, it's just a matter of how you feel. If you find benefit, like just like a soothing benefit to stretching after training, absolutely, you can do it. I would just be mindful of the, the duration in which you stretch. Yeah, so just to add on to that, we're gonna assume that when we say stretching, we're thinking of that static stretching or passive stretching. So let's say the, the most uh, basic example would be sitting down with your legs out straight and reaching for your toes. So trying to stretch out the hamstring. So that would be an example of static stretching or, or passive stretching. So things like that, that's what we're talking about when we talk about this slide. They, they're not reducing injury, nor are they um, gonna improve your performance per se, especially if you do it for a certain amount of time, it actually might decrease your performance. So usually what happens or what seems to be the most beneficial um, to help either mitigate injury or alter your performance in a positive way is movement preparation. So movement preparation can just be, um, and we're gonna be going over this later in the presentation, is mimicking the movements you're about to do in sport, but do it in a very controlled way. And usually you alter the speed, so a little slower, a little bit uh, more focused on the posture, a little bit more mindful on the positions, things like that. That's gonna help at least mitigate your, perform or sorry, mitigate your injury uh, risk and or alter your performance. Um, and then like Jordan said, afterwards, if you wanna do that static stretch to kind of uh, warm the body down, or calm your tissues, that's definitely 
warranted. You're not going to injure anything because you're not going to now jump back into the sport and perform those movements again. You're just going to recover. So that, that won't change anything in a sense uh, negatively. Yeah, I think to add on to that, I was just talking to someone from my, my Capoeira group the other day. I think one of the best means of stretching would be just doing movements that you would do during training. So it's kind of like the movement preparation in another sense, just practicing your sport might be enough to give you that dynamic feedback that your, your joints need and your muscles need. Nice. So we, we have another question and then we'll, we'll move on to the awesome. actual movements. Uh, in regards to submission defense, are we saying that stretching has no benefit? Mm, fantastic question. So let's, this, this will be talked about towards the, uh, in the BJJ portion, but let's say you take a Kimura, for instance, where you're really cranking the arm behind the person's back. So that person has to have a certain amount of shoulder mobility to do that. Uh, or to, to experience that and not to get injured, or if they choose not to tap, they have to have a lot of capacity in that shoulder. So stretching per se is not gonna help with that, but what is gonna help would be doing active mobility work into that range of motion, and also just strengthening of the shoulder joint in general. So if we can get that shoulder joint at a higher capacity, tolerating rotational forces, tolerating just the, uh, the contraction of the muscle and or the shoulder girdle and the shoulder girdle is just the shoulder blade and the actual true shoulder joint. So if you can increase all those things, you're gonna help that range of motion. So they've done research on this where just the actual act of motion will equally improve the range versus static stretching. And they usually do it at the pec uh, or trying to stretch out the chest versus the actual behind the back motion but that's a great question and we'll, we'll dive into it pretty deep when we get into the um, movement portion do you think we have time for one one more quick question sure yeah got another one about isometric stretching which is uh so if those of you for those of you who aren't familiar with isometric movement it's basically moving a mu using a muscle without moving it so you're activating the muscles and it's staying in the same position uh, I prescribe these, and, and Lee, you might have a different take, but I don't think so because we, we're kind of like-minded. <laughs> I use these as a barrier to getting through a range of motion that you don't already have, either because of pain or because of what we call stretch intolerance, meaning that you, you just reach a point where your body, your nervous system is saying, I don't want to move anymore. And you can use isometrics in that means to gain longer term benefits like i would use isometrics over just static stretching bar none all the time however i wouldn't say do an isometric hold before you use it in performance i, I don't know how you feel about that lee but i wouldn't tell someone to do a bunch of isometrics and use tension and energy before um they perform yeah, it, it definitely would depend on the position. Let's say, let's take the hamstring. That's the easiest example, right? So if you're saying um, we're going to contract the quad, the opposing muscle, as hard as we can to stretch the hamstring, that might be helpful in preparing that, that area to work. But then if you're talking about contracting the hamstring itself to stretch the hamstring, that might be counterintuitive or sorry, counterproductive because um, you are fatiguing that area if it needs to perform in the you know a couple of minutes or 10 minutes whatever it is but overall i'm not a um i'm not against like isometric stretching there is some movements that we'll, we'll go over that will require isometric contraction to stretch the muscle or actually put the body in position but i agree with jordan where the isometrics are traditionally used to overcome a barrier that maybe there's a, a limit in the range of motion in the joint and then we would have the person hold it there and then try again, see if we can get into that range. All right, I think um, we should roll on. These are excellent questions and I always get so, I don't know, I'm so on top of it when people, I just wanna give them all the information right away. But Go for uh, it. Let's, get in, let's get into what people uh, came here for. So this is me showing off uh, my professional <laughs> photos, uh, but, Talking about what do we do now that we're stuck at home and we're not training. Think about all of the movements that you are having difficulty with and what prerequisite 
range of motion or strength or motor control that you need in order to do them successfully. So we're both gonna share uh, areas of improvement in our, um, our sports of expertise. So I would not by any means say that I'm a capoeira expert. I just, I love training it. I've gained a lot of value from it. And um, it's helped me appreciate a lot about movement. So here I listed, and I know we have a lot of capoeiristas on the call, so I wanted to throw a lot of stuff in there. I listed some of the tightness and weaknesses that we might experience during certain moves that we, we adopt in capoeira, and I'm gonna go through each of them specifically. And then Lee is gonna take over after that. All right. Next slide. Yeah. This move drives me insane. Uh, I, I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that I get enough power behind uh, the, this is a, a Portuguese lesson for some of you. This is a meia lua de compasso. Uh, and it's a very effective round kick, but it does require a lot of hip torque, a lot of use of your, your thoracic spine to be able to generate force from the ground. And they all have to be working in unison. But I know, no, go ahead, you can go. Uh, I put here two exercises that you can do because one of the things I think I know from my experience is that actually getting my, getting to look between my hands when they're on the ground is limited because of hip tightness. So I wanted to show you guys two things that you can do if you're experiencing hip tightness in the Mei Lua Ji Yep, so the first one, shout out Abada Capoeira. Uh, so this is a position that, and there's going to be a little bit of overlap moving uh, forward. But actually, Lee, let's run it back one more time and then pause it when I'm standing all the way up at the top. So basically, you're going to start with one foot in front of the other. This is the shin box position, which Lee's going to talk about. As you come up to the top, you're going to rotate towards the hip that's forward. So my hip in the front is in external rotation, which is exactly where you need to be when you're doing mea lua. And me twisting my torso towards that front knee is stressing the hip joint even more. You could just go straight up and down, but it's really allowing you to stress it more. And then controlling the movement on the way down, so go ahead, is also important. You don't want to just plop down. You want to control it down because that's that motor control that I was talking about that's important to be good at kicking. And then the other one, it's not exactly the, well, I actually took this from Capoeira. This is Sometimes there's a lot of value in just doing the movements. So looking underneath your leg repeatedly and doing this sort of flow, uh, I think is a great way to challenge the ligaments and the tissues in those positions that are gonna normally hinder your ability to move that. And I'm thinking all the graduados on the call are like, hmm, is that actually good? But I, I, think, uh, I think my form's looking better for sure because <laughs> I continue to stress that movement. Okay, uh, let's, let's go on. And this one's called Boch. Uh, this is part of our, uh, we do Bangela training. So a lot of hands, uh, a lot of groundwork. One of the areas in Boch that people might experience a flaw in performance is that shoulder that's on the floor away from my body. If you don't have good shoulder stability during here, you, you got nothing. You're gonna fall down and you're not gonna be able to protect yourself. So go ahead. One of the things that you can do to work on your shoulder stability is actually put your hand in that position where you're compromised and force it to work. This is giving your brain feedback that this is exactly how your shoulder needs to perform in order to be successful. Because I like there would be value in doing a regular push-up. There might be some carryover, but it's at this particular range where people who are having shoulder stability issues would be failing. So I say, Go to where you're failing and do stuff. When in doubt, go to where you're failing and do stuff. This one, I actually read a blog uh, by another capoeirista that knee pain and negativa are like spaghetti and meatballs for some people. <laughs> it, 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 there's a lot of stress on the knee, uh, particularly the one that's bent, but also could be on the one that's uh, straight, more straight. Uh, it's a very deep knee bending position, but it's essential to be a good capoeirista to do this position. So the first one is a combination of a hip opener, but also opening up uh, the knee joint, really putting stress 
on that medial knee joint. So medial meaning the inner part of the knee. So basically what you would do is you would get into this Spider-Man position. You place your elbow on the inside part of your thigh or your knee, and you would just let your knee and your ankle fall out. So you're gonna feel a stretch in your hip and the inner part of your knee and your ankle as well. But it's in order for you to be able to adopt the position that you see these two uh, lovely ladies assuming uh, to the left. And then we go to the bottom one, which is one of my favorite exercises that I incorporate all the time. You need maximum control for knee flexion. You need to own this movement because we spend so much time with this amount of knee bending that if you don't own it and you continually put stress on a position that you don't own, it could increase your likelihood for injury. Now, one of the overarching themes is that we can't prevent injury risk. It's impossible. Anything could happen. We could leave our apartment, step off a curb, and we can hurt ourselves. But all we can do is decrease our likelihood by preparing us for situations where our knees or life that could just take us. All right, nothing in the chat. Good. Okay. Uh, this, our kicks, our, our front kicks in particular, require a lot of stability on our, our stance leg and our ability for our hips and our torsos to generate power. I know from my experience in Taekwondo, that's also the case and pretty much any sport involving a kick. Uh, the guy on the left is doing a pisao because his foot is, um, his toes are pointed towards him. So this is more of a push kick. Uh, but the exercise I have, which is one of many that you can do, and for all these, there's many exercises that you can do is trying to force yourself to stand on that stance leg and really own your stability. And I know it's a short clip. Uh, believe it or not, I can't hold it much longer than this before falling without holding onto a support. But you could hold onto a wall or you could do this against a wall and use that to help increase the amount of time you stand on your leg while you keep that other foot extended. So it's another drill I like to do. And I've actually started doing it quite a bit because my, my kicks can use a lot of work. This is, I think when I think capoeira, I think this is so unique to capoeira is uh, kerejihines, which uh, translates to falling on the kidneys. I'm pretty sure that's, that's what it means. Uh, I know that other movement classes I've taken have actually taken this and they've given credit to capoeira for, for being the originators of this movement. But it's essential to be proficient at this movement, to have the ability to get that elbow tucked right into your side. So if you're not, if you're lacking in shoulder mobility or your ability to get your scapula, your shoulder blade down and back, you're gonna have a pretty poor shelf in which to rest your whole body on. So to the right. Ah, mm -hmm. oh. oh, you gave it away. All right. So this is one thing you can do to improve that ability. So as I step forward with my hand fixed against, I'm on my rooftop, which I'm not supposed to be on. So don't tell my landlord I'm on my rooftop, but it, you know, social distancing, right? If I keep my arm fixed and I keep move, I step forward and backward, it's a dynamic stretch to my lat and my chest. So it's gonna help improve my ability. So yes, it's a stretch. And I think this would be one of the stretches I would say you could do before performance because it's more dynamic. Um, but this is going to help your ability to create that shelf to get your elbow tucked right under to your ASIS. And um, I've actually become pretty good at these because I've been working a lot on this. And just to pass the mic over to BJJ specialist and talk about the rest of the martial arts so not to neglect you guys. Uh, this is the last movement I, I came up with for capoeira that I, I find I have some tightness in my groin doing and I can see a lot of because of the position of that outstretched leg and and there's, you could have tightness in the leg that's bent as well but certainly you want to be able to have good control over that that pull because this is a sweep in capoeira and if you don't have a strong inner thigh group you're not going to have a strong sweep so to the right is a uh, what we call a Copenhagen adductor plank. It's kind of difficult to do at home unless you have a coffee table or a bench or a chair that you could put your leg under, underneath. But basically what's doing the work is the leg that's attached to the top part of the bench. 
and I'm just holding myself there. And there are ways to progress this, but basically this is providing that activation that uh, Dr. Scantilides was talking about uh, in the inner thigh. Cool. I could talk about capoeira for days, but I think you should take it away from me. <laughs> All right. So um, like Jordan was saying, you're gonna see a lot of carryover with the exercises only because I think martial arts in general really um, have unique movement requirements, unique movement prerequisites. But um, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in particular poses a unique challenge for us as therapists because there's so many um, movements that we don't normally do as adults. So, 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 much, so many ground movements, so many uh, joint breaks and strangle holds. I mean, these things are not done regularly as other martial arts. But I would say BJJ even more only because we're all doing this on the ground. So um, just to go over some, uh, some top tier things that I see both in myself and some of my patients and also that's existing in the research. Uh, we have hip mobility and neuromotor control for guard retention and guard play. Your shoulder stiffness, especially when you're getting submitted and or trying to do positional escapes like an arm bar escape, what they call the hitchhiker escape, for instance, and also just the ability to be on the hands and knees. So crawling, any sort of quadruped strength, anything that you would have to do on the ground. So turtle position, guard passing, um, even falling from a throw, that's a huge part of being able to mitigate injury risk. Uh, but we'll go over these individually here. So just to go down the line, I would say uh, we're going to go over something called controlled articular rotations and a 90-90 uh, drill that Jordan was kind of demonstrating to some extent in the previous slides, a shin box hip drill for hip mobility. Then we wanna go into thoracic mobility and that posterior capsule extensibility using something called swimmers. So thoracic mobility has a direct tie into true shoulder joint mobility only because if the thoracic spine can't move, neither can your true shoulder. Now, where is the thoracic spine? The thoracic spine is in between your neck and your lumbar spine or your low back. So that it's that rib cage and it should be a very stiff structure because it houses your vital organs, but we can do some things to increase its mobility and the ability for it to twist and compress. Um, to address the quadruped issues, we can do things like bear holds, rocking, crawling. Uh, we just wanna increase the strength there and the familiarity of that movement. So just to start with hip mobility, hip cars was devised by someone named Dr. Andrew Ospina, and he devised something called the FRC system or the functional range conditioning. They really are the cornerstone to the system itself, but basically it's the most simplest form of doing hip, or sorry, uh, mobility work. So this is a great one for BJJ practitioners prior to working out called hip cars in quadruped position. And I'm just exploring every range of motion that I can in my hip. So I first um, go into, I'll just rewind this really quick. Um, I'm gonna first go into that hip extension and then I'm gonna go around into hip abduction and do some, oop, sorry about that, hip rotation. But basically just trying to do every motion that I can in a controlled fashion. So I keep my arms very straight. I'm keeping my neck and my lower back pretty stiff and I'm not letting anything else move as I do this. Um, and let me see if I go a little bit further here. This is just more of the same. And this kind of give you the key points here. Hands underneath the shoulders, the spine is uh, neutral, and I'm just moving my hip only. So my, um, my femoral tabular joint. All right. This is called the 90-90 drill. Jordan was showing some um, shin box movements, but in the 90-90 position, so this is one basic one. And why would we wanna improve this? So think about your ability to do like a triangle or your butterfly guard, or even just general guard retention. This is gonna help you increase your uh, hip mobility and neuromotor control. So it seems pretty simple, but you start in that 90-90. And then you're gonna, again, explore these ranges actively. So I'm not using my hands, I'm just using my hips. So I'm gonna first go into external rotation of that right hip go into a little bit into rotation, come into neutral here, control it, and then reverse it. And then I'm just gonna keep going back and forth. This video is sped up pretty quick. I think I'm going at least two times the video speed. So this should be done pretty slowly. And if you needed to start off 
um, with touching the hands to the ground. The next slide is going to go into some progressions for the, or regressions for that. So that's, that's the important thing too. The quality of motion is super important when you do these things. This can definitely be done prior to BJJ um, just to help warm up the hips and prepare the hips to do what they need to do during that time. And hopefully this is going to fast forward. Okay, yeah, so just going back and forth there. So this is some progressions um, of the shin box. So let's say you have attained that basic shin box position of that 90-90. So if we go up to sitting here, I'll pause it. I'm going to put down my hands on the ground. It's going to help me control the shin box. So I'm here. I have my good posture. I have my uh, hip in the front and external rotation, hip in the back and internal rotation. Then I'm going to go up to a half lunge. That's another thing too about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. One should be pretty proficient going from the ground to either a half kneel or all the way to standing. We're constantly changing positions, but from the ground, so you should be able to initiate that from the ground. I, I put this picture here of setting up from mount to an arm bar. I think some people call this the S mount, um, but uh, uh, I would just call it the 90-90 position. So we, we're doing this all the time and to practice these over and over again is super important. So here's the hands down position. This is the first progression. The next one would be just with the dowel, so no hands. So I'm, this is similar to the previous video, and I'm just practicing that. And then if you get really good, you can start to add weight. Um, and you could do it either with kettlebell, dumbbells, whatever you like. This would be um, what they call a tactical get up if you come from the kettlebell world without the overhead position. So these are just some general examples on how to strengthen that. Again, if there's any questions, you can just either voice it or uh, shoot it in the chat. So you let us know. So moving on to thoracic mobility. Again, this is super important just for the movement of the shoulder itself. So if we are uh, starting off really basic, this would be my starting point for everybody is just get on the hands and knees and do something called a cat cow. In the uh, FRC world, they call this segmental cat-cow, but I've talked to a couple of people who practice yoga pretty uh, frequently, and they just say, this is just a regular cat-cow. This is how everybody should be doing it, where they segment each part of the spine. So they're gonna segment the lumbar spine from the thoracic spine. And I'm just trying to isolate each movement from each part of the spine. Again, this video is sped up pretty fast. Um, so you should do this very slowly and with control. Right. So no questions on that. Very good. So moving to the next part of thoracic mobility, I like to bring my, my patients to is something called thoracic rotation and child's pose. I first saw this at a seminar that was led by a chiropractor named Greg uh, Liebenson, Craig Liebenson. And I thought it was just a fantastic um, modification to this rotation. So typically we would do this on the hands and knees or in quadruped, but by sitting back on my heels, I lock up my lumbar spine and I'm just isolating my thoracic. And then I gently put my hand behind my ear and I'm rotating over and over again. So this is just helping just the thoracic spine and the shoulder get used to rotation. There's many times in BJJ that will be contorted where our, th our torso will be twisted one way and our lumbar spine will be twisted the other. This is a great way to prepare the body for that. So this would be great to do prior to BJJ practice along with the segmental cacao. Now that question earlier regarding stretching and submissions, this is a pretty good example of it. I do have to admit this would be um, kind of a final tier progression of this exercise, but we can talk about the regressions on, of it. So we would label this as a swimmer. So I have, um, my head on the pillow, I'm sitting back in that child's pose position or my, my glutes are on my heels. And again, the reason why I'm doing that is to lock out my lumbar spine and isolate my thoracic. This time we're not improving mobility. I would say we're improving more the strength of my thoracic extensor and also my shoulder girdle muscles. So I would put this as an exercise to increase the capacity of my shoulder joint, but very specific to behind my back. So this is all uh, both above my head and behind my back. So you could do this while you lie on your, your stomach completely without the child's pose position and without the yoga blocks. You could just start with that. So just to quickly look at the behind the back position. 
as long as I don't skip ahead here. Oops, sorry. Okay, so my thumbs are rotated uh, are pointing up to the ceiling. So I'm technically doing internal rotation, kind of mimicking what would be like a Kimura hold or the, um, the movement of what would be the Kimura. And the example up here that I, I gave was be the hitchhiker escape from an arm bar. That requires a lot of behind the back motion. I hear a lot of stories about people doing the hitchhiker escape um, either inefficiently or too fast and they injure their elbow or their shoulder. So doing things like this could mitigate injury in those, those positions. So that's super important to know. I'll just let this play out just a little bit, just to show the full range. This is at regular speed. So again, this should be done pretty slowly. And I'm really focused on my position, my posture, and just every part of the motion. Excellent. So no questions so far. All right. So we have one for the, we have one, but we'll address it at the end. Okay, cool. So I had a question, but I think I'll just save it for the end. Okay. If that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll take the, we'll take some Q&A at the end for sure. Thank you. So this is something, you know, when I, I have my patients who do BJJ and I just have them go on their hands and knees and I just have them rock back and forth. They look at me like I'm crazy, but I, I cannot understate this. This is probably one of the more important things to do as a BJJ practitioner. One has to be really familiar and strong in this position. So one of the things that you could do is just general rocking. I, I would recommend doing this every day. And you, I wouldn't do it for 10 reps. I wouldn't do it for 20 reps. I'd say 50, 100 reps. You're not going to overdo rocking. The reason why I say this is that ability to get on your hands and knees compress your wrists, compress your knees, rock your hips back and forth, get your big toe working is so important. Not only for things like turtle position and transitioning into guard passing and things like that, but just in general to practice groundwork. You should be able to transition nearly everything, meaning uh, getting up from the, the ground from this position, getting back down into this position quickly, things like that. So this is just a video on how I usually, what I bring patients through. So I first ask them to get in that general hands and knees position and I have them put their feet close together and their knees wide. And what that does is that opens up the hips and leaves a little bit more room for their hips to move in relation to their lumbar spine. I make sure that their hands are right underneath their shoulders. I ask them to keep their neck very neutral and then just rock back and forth. And I'm looking for many things. I'm looking for pain in the wrist and the knees. I'm looking for limitations in their, their toes. A lot of them cannot even put their toes like this. Then the next stage would be to assume a more pointed position, right? So they're going to get more range of motion in their ankles when they start to point their toes there a little bit. Um, and they're going to start to rock further back and forth. So sorry, I'll keep going here. And they go to the toes. And then ask them to lift their head, see if they're comfortable with just lifting their head. And then you can also just do uh, fast and slow and really bouncing off the knees. Your knees should tolerate this. So a common injury in BJJ, and I think in any other martial art, is a meniscus injury. And so one of the, um, you know, the, the key things or stereotypical things would be, I, I can't bend my knee as far as I want to, especially in the hands and knees position. So sometimes just bending your knee or, or rocking into that edge of discomfort and or limitation and rocking back and forth can gradually increase your range. So that this is, can be a very helpful thing for meniscus injuries. I would also offer uh, the variation of rocking circular, uh, in a circular fashion. So if I were to bring the slider all the way to the end here, I just start to circle. I'm gonna go one direction for like a set of 10 and another direction for a set of 10. This is a great way to get the knee, wrist, shoulder, really familiar with the rocking motion. Okay, great. Another big one that, um, again, my patients look at me like uh, I'm asking them to do something crazy, is this crawling. This is a picture, I took a screenshot of a video that I saw uh, from a world championship, I think it was in 2017. Um, and if uh, I don't have the video of it right now, but um, the individual in the blue gi uh, successfully took down the individual in the white gi. 
and he literally tapped his hand two or three times supporting his entire body weight before he went to the ground. Now for him not to injure his shoulder, he has to have really strong shoulders and really tolerant wrists and elbows. So there's been studies done on common injuries during competition, high level competition. And one of the most common injury is the elbow. And one of the most common causes of the elbow injury is what they call a fall on an outstretched hand. So being taken down and not preparing for that fall. So to strengthen the wrists, the elbows and the shoulders, I cannot think of a better exercise besides the Turkish getup, which we can't go over today, but crawling is one of the simplest things you could do. This is an example of a very fast leopard and then we'll do a, a Spider-Man crawl. I'm doing, uh, moving my arms and legs in a reciprocal fashion and I'm trying to keep my head posture the same and I'm trying to keep my pelvis pretty level. There's gonna be a slow motion portion of this video uh, that will show that a little bit more in detail. But all the while, one should be able to do this for BJJ. Obviously, you don't have to do it quickly. And I'm, the next slide is going to be one of the base exercises that I start people with when I want to introduce them to crawling. So you can see I'm moving my opposite arms and legs together. So right now, my left arm is back. My left knee is forward. So my right arm is forward. My right leg is back. And I'm moving them together. And I'm trying to do that all the way through. So if one can't do this yet with control, I'm gonna have them do the next slide, which is called the baby crawl. I learned the progressions of crawling from something called the Original Strength Institute. And uh, they, they have a very specific system of crawling. And so I really go back to all of their material for this. And I think they're great just to, for BJJ practitioners or anybody who's trying to improve general strength. Uh, but this would be a, a baby crawl, simple as it may seem, try to do this for 10 minutes while keeping head posture, while keeping wrist position, shoulder position. This individual is just demonstrating some rotation with the neck, you don't have to do that. But one drill if you want to experiment with this, take the baby crawl, put the timer on for 10 minutes or five minutes, just do this back and forth. You can even do it in your apartment or your house, five to 10 feet, and just see how, how exhausting it is. It's pretty taxing in a good way. Okay, so I was going to talk a little bit about Muay Thai. How are we doing, Jordan, on, on time? So, so, I think your mic's off, sir. Yes, it was. Uh, we have about like six, five minutes before eight o'clock. Uh, probably around then we'll open it for uh, Q&A. Okay. So I'll go this, through this pretty quickly. Yes, that would be, that would be great. Okay. So Muay Thai also poses some interesting challenges for us when we want to improve our areas of possible deficiency. And one of the main things I would say is similar to all the other martial arts is hip mobility and then adductor flexibility. And then sometimes hip and trunk rotation for punching and kicking strength, strength is uh, limited. But more so, I see a lot of big toe or your first toe mobility issues for effective striking. So if we want to look at that first part, the adductor flexibility and the hip mobility, uh, a simple frog stretch you could do. And this is just getting down on the knees, getting really wide, have the uh, feet uh, dorsiflexed or pulled back like this, and you're just rocking back and forth. One thing, a small detail I would say to keep in mind is keep your back arched while you do this. So don't let your back round, just keep it arched. That's gonna help you stretch your adductors a little bit better. Uh, progression or variation of this was just go down on elbows. This is a little bit more of a challenge than on the hands. The elbows provide a little bit less stability and you're down lower into the stretch. If you want to progress even further, you get one leg out. So this is a variation of using the isometric. I would recommend it getting that quad really tight as you rock back and forth and pulling your ankle up to your shin. That, that way you're really mimicking a kick or what's going on when you kick. Excellent. Yeah, and just to interject really quickly, please. Uh, none of these movements are specific to, and I don't know if Lee mentioned this, are specific to the sports we're attaching them to. I look at this exercise from my capoeiristas and I say, This is another exercise that would be great for improving groin flexibility and mobility for that movement. So just because we're incorporating these movements specifically to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Muay Thai, there's a lot of transfer 
to pretty much any martial art. Absolutely. Proceed. Awesome. So this is um, a, some progressions on a Cossack squat. So let's say you've, you've done all the frog stretching, you've really progressed there and you, really, you feel comfortable with that. The next stage would be something called a Cossack squat. So um, you could start with the TRX, a suspension training system, and just getting into these positions. Again, I'm working on my posture. I'm working on my active contraction of the straight leg, active contraction of the bent leg. And I'm really trying to focus on that transition as I go back and forth. The next stage would be holding on to something secure, like a post, a pole, or a squat rack, and you're just going back and forth. This is going to, um, in terms of BJJ practitioners, I, I think next to hands and knees position, I'd say this is equally important to improve only because of things like neon belly or guard passing, like a, a knee slide. We do this all the time in some way or another in, in BJJ. And so if, if you're not familiar with this, if your body's not familiar with this or comfortable with it, it's gonna be all that more challenging. BJJ is already challenging and you really wanna reduce the things uh, that are, are, are challenging, especially for your body to, to mitigate that injury risk. This is just an extra rotation. Doesn't really worry about the progressions here. Uh, we don't have to go into this. This is just something I usually test my patients with to see uh, if they can do. It gives me a litmus test of their progression. Um, basic hip rotation. CKC stands for closed kinetic chain uh, for hip internal rotation. This is a drill that you could do. You don't have to use a resistance band or a kettlebell. It could just be done on its own. So without the kettlebell, without the band, set up on one knee. I'm keeping my uh, lumbar spine neutral, keeping my neck neutral. My head is moving with my arms. My arms are an extension of my torso. And I'm just rotating over this hip. So if we look at this more closely, my left hip is the one that's working. I'm getting internal rotation out of this hip. And I'm getting um, more familiarity into that. And so you would just add this back and forth. So it can be done with the band, without the band, with the kettlebell to block motion or without. Next stage would be to uh, add some rotation into the kneeling again. So this is just a quick picture on how important rotation is for effective striking if you don't want to fatigue your shoulder too much or ask your shoulder to do so much work. So this is a great drill to do on, on the knee here. The, the key details I would say to set up one knee down in that neutral 90-90 or that, sorry, knee bend at 90 degrees, hip extended, and then your hip flexed, uh, knee bent here. My elbow is up and I'm rotated in my torso as much as I can, but I'm looking forward. My, my eyes never change. My other arm is opposing the movement completely, whereas I'm gonna push here, I'm about to pull with my right arm. So I pull with my right arm, I push my left, and I'm gonna end up rotating as far as I can there. Again, my head is not, changing, I'm looking as far forward as I can, and I'm just gonna keep repeating that back and forth. This does not have to be done with a band. You could just do it with, uh, without the band and just practicing the motion, slow and controlled, and keeping some good tension in the body. Another variation or progression of that would be standing. The first time I saw this, this way of doing this was when I attended a Paul Check seminar. If you guys don't know who Paul Check is, he's a longtime trainer, been around for many years, um, but this is, I learned this from uh, one of his key exercises where you start in this, what they call back stance in martial arts. They usually do this in Taekwondo and karate. And you have that arm out, elbow should be up there and you're just rotating and punching. And that rotating and punch is just being able to get into that lunge, right? So I'm starting that back stance and I'm gonna get into this lunge right here and I'm fully rotating, getting my, my torso fully rotated around and getting as much power as I can. This does not have to be done with a band. I think for the sake of time, for great toe mobility, I'm just gonna go over one of these and that's this guy. Just being able to actively raise your toe. You might be saying to yourself, I cannot do this for the life of me. I've never even tried to do this. That is fine, that is very, common and we don't normally do this. Um, so it does take practice. Patients I do this with, if they can't do this on the first time, I have them just actively push down those other toes and see if they can get their big toe to rise and I just have them go back and forth. 
don't worry about the second part where the little toes come up. You would just focus on the big toes. So that big toe mobility is actively raising that, that guy up and down. Pretty easy. Hey Lee, just a heads up where, uh, oh, it's me. Okay, yes. I can run through this really quickly. Okay, sorry about uh, that. Yeah, you're just so passionate about your, your craft. <laughs> I, I am almost in, in awe just listening to you. I can, <laughs> Thank you, yeah. sir. Uh, so I, like I said before, I have a background in judo. I tried to incorporate some movements from judo, although I know we don't have as many judo practitioners on the call. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through two. Uh, that I had difficulty with when I was training. And now that I understand movement more from a physical therapist perspective, uh, I can chime in. So the first one, go ahead, Lee, is a uh, Morote Sewinagi, which uh, our black belt in judo just left the call. So he was, he's not going to be impressed by my, my uh, pronunciation of that. Oh, no. But basically it's a shoulder throw, but you bring your elbow across the chest. So you're grabbing onto the gi and getting your elbow so in him his case he's bringing his right elbow under the right armpit of the gentleman he threw but having a tight lat or chest like same as the capoeiristas would have challenges with with keta uh this is something that's worth working on in order to get that elbow flexibility so i'm sitting back in a child's pose with my elbows on an elevated surface and then you can grab a stick or a broomstick or this is a this is a broomstick, but you can grab a Swiffer, any sort of PVC pipe, and sink your chest low towards the ground as you bend your elbows. So you're really creating thoracic extension through the shoulder blade and stretching out your lats and your chest uh, dynamically. So again, could be good for Ketajihines, but also very good for Morote Siwinagi. And this was uh, one of the most popular holds that we did in Judo, which is called Kezagatami. Gatame, I think that's a better means of pronouncing. I'm not Japanese, but uh, this is one of the holes that we did. We uh, would cup the arm underneath the shoulder, but it's very important to keep your center of gravity low here because the person on the ground is going to try and roll out of it. Usually they roll to the left and try and toss you up. They're going to do a bridge uh, while they're on the ground, which is curling your toes underneath and trying to throw you off of them. So you really got to keep your chest low. But a lot of that is limited with your hip. So that front hip there is really important in order to pin the opponent down. So I have here, you're basically putting your hip in that position and just moving dynamically over your knee in order to sort of train your body that it's okay to assume those deep bending positions in your hip so that you can gain more of an advantage over your opponent when you're on, on the ground. Yeah, that was Judo 101 in like two minutes. Uh, but I, I definitely want to leave time for questions because you guys have some great ones. Uh, but this is how you guys can stay connected with us. Most of you know where to find me or you got my email already. But if you want to talk to us a little bit more in depth, this is where you can find us. Uh, we we want to stay in touch with you guys because this is our passion to talk about martial arts and movement in general and uh, anything that you guys wanted to talk about. Uh, we're more than willing also because you guys were also great. Uh, Lee and I, Dr. Scantilidis, Lee, what do you want, you want me to call you Lee or Dr. Scantilidis? You can call me Lee. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're, we're both uh, open to having a free 30 minute consultation with every one of you on the call. If, should you guys choose, we really want to help you become better practitioners and address any concerns that you might have. So reach out to us after the call and we can set that up. But now we're going to open the floor for questions. Uh, we did have one in the chat from before, and I think someone had a question uh, about the BJJ content. So actually, let's start with, was it Tori? Was it you with the question from before? Yeah, uh, let's start yes. with you. Um, so I was curious about um, that lumbar stability, because I find that in myself, and I think it's com mostly common probably in a lot of people to have a lot of rotation in their lumbar spine, and that's supposed to be um, a pretty stable segment or section of the spine. So what would you recommend for practitioners to do to, like other than modifying a movement and getting into like a child's pose to then work on thoracic extension, but like what would be a progression to tighten up the lumbar spine and still get that rotation in the thorax? 
Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so to um, just to make sure I get it right, you, you wanna you wanna be able to stabilize the lumbar spine, possibly reduce its ability to rotate in terms of how much it go, but still have that thoracic mobility. Yes. So yeah, I, I would I would address those on separate movements and or exercises. So I would say for the thoracic mobility, it could be any of the ones that you saw back there. And then there's another one that um, we didn't go over because that requires a little bit more. Um, Queuing, but it would be a kettlebell arm bar, but it's very similar to some of the other stuff there. But in terms of lumbar stability, uh, you could do things like just holding a bear position, which I didn't show, and that's just hands and knees. Uh, take, the, take the knees off the ground and you just time yourself, see how long you can hold it there, maybe put a yoga block on your lower back, and that will give you a cue to how, or anything that, or like a shoe or anything, and that will give you a cue to see how far you're rotating. Um, to progress that, once you're on the hands and knees, you can do something called creeping, either in the bear position or just hands and knees. So that's just lifting up one arm, putting it on the shoulder, and then lifting up the opposite knee. And then you just keep switching back and forth. So that's, that's a one drill. And then for thoracic mobility, you could just all, um, do those other ones that we went over today. That should be sufficient without compromising the lumbar mobility. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. We had a more broad question about um, the body's ability to adapt over time. So is there a certain age by which the development of our body's abilities like flexibility or strength capacity plateau? Cool. That's, that's loaded, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, this is something that research is looking at like heavily in a sense uh, are, are especially in tendons. I think tendon research is the most popular right now. Um, from what I can gather in terms of its ability, it, as we get older, it for sure gets less resilient, but that has so many variables to it in terms of your genetics, your activity, um, your activities levels throughout your entire life. How active were you when you were young? That does have a, a big, Thing to play into it in terms of bone density, uh, tissue thickness, things like that. Um, but I do have to say on the positive end of it, they've studied populations where they thought they couldn't get changes in, like older than 65 years old, and they've got changes in tendons, muscles, bones, just from doing a strength training program. So I would say, yes, there is less resiliency as we get older in terms of the exact age. I, I couldn't speak to that. I think it's too broad in terms of um, to give you an exact answer, um, but you can mitigate those decreases in capacity with training. And I would, I'm biased towards strict strengthening. And I'm talking about, you know, lifting weights, uh, either barbell, kettlebell lifts, body weight, um, all those things are very important. You, you have to put your, your, your tissues through some sort of weight bearing exercise to get some response if you want to get some resiliency. I don't have anything to add. That was, uh, <laughs> you pretty much summed up the evidence uh, eloquently. Thank you. Uh, just uh, someone had a question about uh, leopard crawls versus bear crawls, if you wanted to clarify the difference between those two. That's a great question. There is no difference. They're, they're exactly the same. So the crawling, <laughs> the crawling that I learned from original strength they have uh, baby, leopard, Spider-Man, and then lizard, which Jordan knows a lot about. Um, and do. those, the, everyone has different um, names for, I would say, the bear and the, the Spider-Man. See, oh, I, put myself, I, I put myself on a limb there because I answered that already privately. See, the bear crawl, when I learned it, was more like a little bit more leniency and hip rotation versus like the beast crawl, which is more you know, pretending that you're basically under a tunnel and you're keeping your back flat. So I didn't take the same school of thought. I, I made an assumption. So sorry for whoever answered that question. That uh, my understanding was a little bit different, but. Crawling is awesome because you could play with yeah. the form. I'd say that what Jordan said about letting your hips go. I, if, if I wanted someone to do long duration, long duration crawling and if they were doing Spider-Man, and it, it, the longer they were reaching, their hips were rotating, I wouldn't mind. Um, but it, if you wanted to do strict 
working on the form, lumbar stability, shoulder stability, then you just keep those hips as neutral as possible. Cool. Yep. Any other questions, guys? Pick our brains. Yeah. Is everyone tired? <laughs> the long call. But definitely, if, uh, if anything comes up afterward, most, like I said, you guys know where to find us. Uh, we really appreciate you guys being on the call with us. And uh, yeah, stay in touch, stay healthy. Kick ass when you get back into the dojo or training center, whatever you guys call it. Yes. <laughs> and uh, see you around. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it.